please welcome to the stage Juan Luisa. Hi everyone, hope you're having a great show. I see a lot of people here this year. It's really uh, uh, getting a lot of attention, going, get, talking about a lot of great technologies. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about some really exciting technologies because there's, there's some big changes happening in the world of data and app dev. And that's what we're, I'm gonna talk about today, the future of data and app dev. So what is it? What's the future of data and app dev? Well, it's all about enabling radical increases in productivity. And I'm gonna get into a lot of detail on this. So how's this gonna happen? Really, it's gonna be about generating data solutions instead of hand coding them. So those are the, that's the big picture, the very, very big picture. So we're gonna generate to innovate. And we're gonna use three transformational strategies. One is to generate use-centric data and I'm gonna go into a good bit of detail on this. The second is we're gonna generate apps altogether. And the third is that we're gonna get a lot of productivity from generative AI. So I'm gonna talk about each of these in turn. So first of all, today, all the parties in the world of data need to tell uh, their data systems not just what they want, but also how to do it. And soon they'll simply declare their intended outcome and the data systems will generate them. So where is each of these parties in their transformation to generating solutions based on declarative intent? Well, the critical parties for the first strategy, the generate use-centric data, are basically data professionals and developers. So let's start with them. So data professionals are the farthest along in their transformation. Uh, let's take a very quick look at, their, at the journey of data professionals. So initially, when the world started, at the beginning of the world, we had two kinds of databases, hierarchical databases and network databases. And in both of these, apps were accessed, access data using hand-coded navigation of storage formats. And then EFCOD revolutionized data management with the relational model, which is based on declarative intent. And there's three main benefits, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to these because it's gonna come back in, in the developer world. Number one is that apps access data using data values, the values in the database, not by hand-coded navigation. Number two, oh, actually, and, and actually the big advantage of that is that changes to the way data is stored or optimized don't break data because you're not navigating the actual storage format, you're just looking at the data. Number two is there's no more need for inconsistent copies of data because data values need to be stored only once. That's called normalization. And number three, relational databases generate access based on declarative intent. So using SQL, the data the user intends to access and the database, the database, I'm sorry, this using SQL, SQL declares the data the user intends to access, and the database generates an optimal execution plan, and using SQL you can also get very powerful joins which are a way of composing data. Okay, so that's it. That's, that's what I'm gonna say about data professionals. Data professionals are very far along. They're the first to generate to innovate. And the huge productivity gains from generating data access using declarative data intent made relational the market leader. All right, so let's move on. What about developers? In the world of development, things are very different. So the concepts of app storing data as a hierarchy and network have been brought back by developers. So document and key value databases are, are kind of a hierarchical database. And graph databases are kind of like a network databases. Now they're not the same, these are different from their predecessors but they share some of the same drawbacks. So if that's the case, then why have these concepts returned? Well, the reason is that normalized relational data, while it's fantastic from a data management perspective, which is what I just talked about, it's not always convenient for app developers. And therefore, they don't like to use it as much. So I'm, I'm gonna walk through an example of how this works. So imagine we've been asked to build an app that creates a student course schedule. 
So it would look something like this. You have the student schedule here for Jill. She's a math major. She's taking two classes, Math 201 and Science 102. It's got a time room and a teacher. So very simple app. Now, with relational, the way you build this is you need a schema with four tables. So you've got a student table, a course schedule, a student courses that maps the student to the courses, and a teacher table. This is great from a data management perspective because you have storage independence, data consistency, declarative queries, all that stuff I just talked about. And the API for the relational model returns data as rows. So the rows for a student schedule can be fetched in a single query by joining all four of these tables. So you write a SQL statement, joins them, you get the schedule. Okay, that sounds pretty good, but uh, the rows are not always convenient for data that's hierarchical. So hierarchical data, when you read it in a join, it repeats the upper levels of the hierarchy. So you can see there, you have the rows with the two classes, but they repeat a bunch of data, the student ID, the student name, the major. Uh, so you get redundancy in, in the result, and at the application level, you have to sort all that out. So it's not, not as convenient as it could be. So this is why developers like think hierarchical models like JSON when the data is naturally hierarchical because it provides an easier API for apps that want hierarchical data. So you can see on the left there what the JSON document looks like. All the data that's in that screen is in that one document. You got the student name, the major, the, and then you have the, the schedule with the two classes. So it's all there, it's all contained in one document. And the nice thing from a developer point of view is that you can simply get the document, you got all the data you need, it's all in one package, you display it, if you want to change anything, you edit the document and you just put it back into the database. So from a developer perspective, this is really nice. And you know, we've recognized that in, in the relational world, to, so to support these applications that want this kind of hierarchical format, we've added JSON as a native data type to the Oracle database and to relational databases in general. And the, the benefit of that is that a single database now has both relational and document data, and that allows it to provide the benefits of both, okay? So that sounds very nice, uh, but there's still a problem, which is when you store data as JSON documents, there are some downsides. So all hierarchical storage models suffer from data duplication issues. And this is easy to show with this example. So, all the students taking a course have a copy of the course schedule and the teacher information, which makes updates expensive and risky. So you see there, those, we have two students, and each of them is taking Math 201, which means all that data is duplicated across every student. So the, the time, the course, the teacher, and what it means is, let's say I wanna change the room for that class. Well, as a JSON developer, I have to go find every student taking this class, and I gotta go update the document in every student. Uh, and I have to do that in some atomic fashion, and if I ever forget to do it, then the data gets out of sync. Um, and the second disadvantage of storing things in JSON is that uh, SQL on relational data is far more powerful, because you're composing tables. It's a, it's a much more powerful language for querying data. All right, so there's these downsides. And today, the way AppDev works is you have to pick one storage model for data. So you pick, do I want tables? Do I want JSON? Do I want graph? And once you've picked, that storage model determines everything about how data is used. So if you pick JSON, you get JSON operations, you get a JSON language, you get JSON APIs. If you pick relational, you get relational operations, you get relational language, you get relational API. So these became separate worlds where everything is different. So you pick one model and now everything is different depending on that first choice. Okay, so that's not so good. So this is the thing that we've been working on. How to unify all these things? How do we avoid all these downsides? And the breakthrough idea is to enable developers to declare data usage intent instead of storage format. So tell us what you want, don't tell us how to store the data. That's basically, that's the high level idea. Um, if you declare the data usage intent, then the database can generate the format and APIs that are best for each app use case. And I'm gonna explain how this works. But first of all, the key thing here is that by using intent, 
That's all we need to extend COD's vision of apps being independent of storage to apps that prefer using data as either a hierarchy or a network. All right, so in this new world, the database can generate the app's preferred usage format while most of the data is stored in the format that's best for queryability and consistency, which we talked about, which is that's a normalized relational format in terms of reducing redundancy, improving consistency, making it queryable. That's generally the best storage format. But, you know, it's not perfect for everything. There's also cases where the schema is dynamic or evolving where you want to store data as JSON, and we can do that as well. All right. So today, going back, there's really two languages in a relational database. There's a data definition language, and that specifies how data is organized. And then there's a data manipulation language which specifies how data is read and written. But it's all about rows. What it's missing today is a language to declare the usage format that best aligns with each app use case. So there's nothing to say, hey, I want to use this as JSON. I want to use this as graph. And so that's what we're going to fill in in our new generation of database. So a data intent language actually is in SQL. It exists, it's called views. And views declare the intent to use a combination of data from multiple tables. So it combines multiple, it basically runs a query that combines multiple tables and produces a single result. However, the relational views are limited to operating on rows and using row API. So they don't, they don't really get us what we want. They, they're good for relational, but they don't get us what we want with these other kinds of formats. Now, we're, what we're doing is we're introducing something new called JSON relational duality. And I'm going to, uh, and to describe how we can extend the data intent language to include JSON documents, I'd like you to welcome Gerald Venzel, who's our lead product manager for developer initiatives, who's going to describe this. <laughs> Gerald, Thanks, welcome. Mom. Thank you. All right. So as Juan said, JSON relational duality views, which are new in Oracle Database 23C, enable Oracle databases to generate JSON format and APIs from relational tables. So that you get what you see there. It's like you have a bunch of relational tables, and you would like to get JSON out of the database. How do we do that? Well. The structure of the duality view mirrors the structure of the JSON document that you want, which makes it super easy to define these by using familiar GraphQL syntax. So what you see here again on the right-hand side, you have this JSON document for student schedule chill that we have seen before. And on the left-hand side, you see the DDL to define the JSON duality view to give you that student schedule. Looks very similar. Now, the view itself simply specifies the tables that contain the data that we want, right? So we want the student schedule. So we start with the student table, and then we traverse to the student courses, courses, and teachers. So this is how we get the hierarchy of the document. Next, the view specifies the table columns that hold the values that we want exposed as JSON attributes, the actual data that we're gonna see in the JSON document. JSON duality views are simple to query using document APIs. Applications can use standard REST API get commands or API calls to get a document from the database. Or they could use the Mongo com MongoDB compatible API that we have or a plain SQL, whatever the application that the developer prefers. Likewise, Updating these duality views or these JSON documents in the database is also simple. Applications just edit the JSON documents that they got and then do a REST a put API back to the duality view or write it back with the MongoDB compatible API or SQL. Again, whatever the application or the developer wants to do. The important part of this is that the database as part of the update automatically detects the changes made to the document and only modifies the rows that have changed. So we don't have to write back the entire document or the entire data set. We only change 
the values that have actually been changed by the application, which gives you, of course, a big performance boost as well. Duality allows JSON documents to include any data that is convenient for the app. So it's an Oracle database. You may have spatial data in it. You may have graph data in it. JSON is one step before, or of course, relational. You can expose all that data into your JSON documents via JSON duality views. But again, the important thing here is that the duality views never duplicate data because underneath the data is stored in normalized tables. And that in itself is a massive benefit for other applications that share the same data. So we have here again the student schedule for Jill and Lucas, both going to this Math 201 class. And the data here still looks duplicate, duplicated because we have these two JSON documents, but they are not in the database. They're coming out of relational tables. So if we want to update the teacher, as Juan said before, we can just simply do one put operation on that, that teacher information and swap it out for everybody. And every application will see that data change reflected. And because any data can be included in documents, Duality provides better JSON to apps than any document database out there that only gives you JSON. The other nice benefit for developers is that JSON duality views allow the same underlying data to be customized to match the needs of each application or the use case of the application. So let's say we have a student schedule microservice that we have seen before. We give your student schedule to chill, but we probably also want the microservice to tell the teacher when and where to show up. Otherwise, the course will be pretty daft, right? So we can create another duality view to just expose the information that the teacher needs to go to the right room giving the right class. The teacher doesn't necessarily need the information about all the students, so we can omit that. And likewise, we probably need somebody who, wants to, who decides which courses a teacher should give, so like a course curriculum. So we write another microservice for that, and again, we have another duality view on the same underlying ta tables or data to expose just that information. Again, the data is never duplicated. We cannot stress this enough because this is the huge downside with the hierarchical format that you don't have here. And hence, you also have it always consistent. So all of these, the use, use case flexibility, no data duplication, always consistent, are all huge benefits for application development overall. Using duality, developers can also add new document-centric applications on top of existing relational data. So you all probably have existing Oracle databases with a lot of data in them. All you need to do to take advantage of JSON duality is upgrade to 23C, and you can start exposing that data via JSON relational duality views or add these new document-centric APIs and use cases to your existing data as well. A lot of people think that document databases are the fastest and best to process JSON documents. They are purpose-built database, single purpose, you know, they, have, they must be the best thing there because that is their use case, right? That's what they were built for. Well, it's actually not true. Duality delivers faster JSON than document databases. Duality views give you better latency for OLTP, they give you better and faster analytics, and they provide automatic parallelization and optimization. So yes, it is really true. Duality is much faster than document stores and key value stores, as a matter of fact. And if you don't believe me, please go ahead, download 23C, and try it out yourself. Duality is also vastly superior to object relational mapping because it provides an architected simplicity that's built into the database rather than it being an ease of use glued on layer like an um, object relational library or framework that you use in your application. Transactional consistency between row updates and document updates are automatically provided by, database, by the database using a new lock-free mechanism or lock-free concurrency model. And deep integration of the new mechanism with database queries, replication, and many, many more make this an ultra-powerful new technology as part of JSON relational duality. The other thing uh, that a duality view allows you to do, or as a developer, they are, they are super easy to adopt. 
So because the transformation to JSON is centralized in the database itself, duality views can be leveraged by any application written in any language. You need nothing in the application tier. And if you already have existing JSON documents today, we also allow you to take those existing JSON documents and the database will transform them into relational tables for you so that you kind of get a head start of what a relational structure or the best relational structure for the duality view for the JSON document would look like. As a side benefit of the REST APIs, you also get the, the benefit that data is now accessed in a single round trip uh, or you go to the database in a single network round trip. Often ORM systems, as they compose the JSON documents or the application objects, they need multiple round trips to the student table, to the course table, to the teacher table, and so forth, incurring multiple network hops to the database. Now, I hope you're excited about JSON duality views. I will hand it back now to Juan to continue this amazing journey of innovation that the Oracle database and you as its customers are on. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Gerald. I think you did a great job um, describing what JSON duality is and, and how it works and how you define it. And it's really simple to define. That's, that's kind of one of the beautiful things about it. Another thing is a lot of developers, they don't, want to, they don't want to create a schema. They just want to start coding. And so we also have a mechanism where they can just write JSON documents out. And at some point, if they choose to, we can basically derive the schema from the JSON documents and create tables and create duality views. So we can actually convert back and forth the same data from JSON to relational, and we, we, we can automate that whole process. So it really, it provides the best of both worlds. And, you know, one thing I, I want to mention is I've been in the data field for, you know, three decades, and um, this is a big deal. You know, what we're doing here is we're unifying the worlds of documents and relational and graph, um, and also objects. So these have been separate worlds for a long time, and we're putting them all together so everything works seamlessly together, and you get the best of everything. You get the consistency, the queryability of relational with all the power and simplicity of JSON. So this is a really big deal, so one thing, I, I would ask you guys, go back and, and, and tell everyone else about this. You're gonna remember this a few years from now. You say, hey, I was at Cloud World in 2023 when this was introduced, because this is gonna go through, this is gonna be an industry-wide transition that's gonna happen. Um, it really is the next generation of, of data management, of data science, and you can read there, uh, IDC, you know, a lot of the industry analysts have been around for a lot of years also agree, this is, this is a huge deal. This is a giant transformation that's happened. Okay, so we talked about JSON. Let me, let me talk a little bit about graph. Uh, so we can also generate graph access, and that's something we've done now with our new property graph views in uh, database 23C. So graphs are basically a powerful way to query connections and relationship between data. So you can kind of follow links across vertices and edges. Uh, and what property graph views do is they allow you to declare intent to treat data as vertices or edges in a graph. And the example here is, suppose I'm a bank and I wanna discover whether anyone transferred money from bank account B to bank account E through multiple, through multiple hops. So there's a lot of reasons to do that. You might be looking for fraud or something like that. This is actually quite difficult to query in relational, in, in SQL. You can do it, but it gets kind of complicated. So, you can create instead what we call a, a graph view. And the way a graph view works is you define the tables that represent vertices. So in this case, we have bank accounts. You know, each row is a bank account. We say, hey, each of these bank accounts represent a vertex in the graph. And then you can also define a different table that represents edges. So in this case, you have money transfers. Money transfers from account B to C, there's the amount, those represent the edges in the graph. And then you do this using a view. And the view is a little bit like the JSON view. You say create property graph view, you tell it the bank account table, 
represents vertexes. The money transfer table represents uh, the edges in the graph. So that's the view. It's about eight lines of, of uh, SQL. And once you've defined the view, you can run a graph query. And the graph query basically has this match statement that's kind of a, a, a pattern that, that it walks through the graph looking for that pattern. And in this case, the pattern it's looking for is money moving from bank account B to E. So you write that query, and the database understands what you're trying to do. It walks the graph and gives you the answer. So it's, this is much simpler. So you see here it's about a six line. You have to learn a little bit about this match thing, but it's a very simple thing to do. Uh, writing the same query for just the three hop uh, would require 12 joins and three unions to write that in SQL. So it's dramatically simpler. Once you pick it up, it's super simple to do. And so you can convert your tables into graphs and vertices. All right, so now that we have this query language, you can use this against all your data. So all your relational data now, you can create these property graph views on top of, and then run graph queries. You can analyze the data, walk through the edges and graphs. It's all available. All the data you have today, it's super simple to do. Um, and that's kind of what Futurum Group says also. All right. So with Oracle Database 23C, you can have an app where one part of the app can treat the data as relational while other parts treat the exact same data as a document, and others treat it as a graph. So what you're getting here is this grand unification of all these models. You can get the best of all these worlds at the same time against the same data. So this is another huge benefit for application development. Get all of it, everything you ever wanted. Um, and I've talked about JSON, duality, and graph, but there's more than that. We've, we've really uh, tried to to fill out the whole declarative usage intent. So there's other things we have in, in the database also. We have something called analytic views, which we've had actually for a few years, that declare analytic intent. They make writing analytic queries dramatically simpler. We've added something in uh, database 23C called domains, and those allow you to declare the data value intent. So you can say, this is a credit card, that's a password, this is a user, this is an email. Uh, we also have added something called annotations that declare uh, the table or column intent. And we've added something called change notification directives that declare notification. So, hey, when this changes, notify that person. Uh, so there's a lot of different things that we've added for uh, data usage intent. Okay, so everything I've described is available in Oracle Database 23C today. It's production in the Oracle Public Cloud. It's also available on premises with our or Oracle database free, and coming soon it'll be available everywhere, on-prem, on every cloud, everywhere else you want it. All right, so to summarize this section, uh, the future for developers is really gonna be generating outcomes by declaring usage intent. You say what you want, we'll get it for you. Do you want JSON, do you want graph, doesn't matter, we'll do whatever you need. And this delivers huge productivity benefits and produces much simpler and more robust apps. This is, this is a really big deal. All right, Wikibon says, um, developing new apps using a pure JSON or graph model is now like committing to using a basic flip phone for 20 years. So this multimodal the ability to do all these different things at once is like a smartphone. It's much more powerful than what existed before. All right, so that's the end of data usage intent. I'm moving on to strategy two, generate apps. So we're generating things. Um, and you hear Larry talking about this a lot. So it's low-code platforms that are leading the transformation, the generating apps, instead of hand-coding them. Um, and low-code platforms, they generate app uh, by using visual tools, so you draw out what you want, and metadata. Uh, and low-code, of course, you know, when you just draw it out, it's much more productive than coding. Um, and in the past, it's been mostly for generating simple apps. So you have something that looks like a spreadsheet or an order entry form. That's been easy to generate. Uh, the challenge for low-code has really been generating complex enterprise-grade apps. That's really been the challenge. Uh, and Oracle Apex, our low-code tool, has been the leader in addressing this challenge. Apex is really unique in the industry in that it, this, it delivers simplicity, the simplicity of low-code without limits which enables uh, using low-code to generate enterprise-grade apps. So 
you can, you can write an application at any level of sophistication using Apex, even the most complex apps. There's no limit on the scale of users, the mission criticality, interoperability, no limits on anything. And today, over two million Apex apps have been written, and there's about 3,000 new Apex apps written every single day. Uh, when IDC surveyed uh, which tools enterprises predominantly prefer for low-code app dev, uh, the results were that Oracle Apex was the most preferred tool. It's more preferred, higher than Power Apps or Salesforce. So it's, it's, it's very popular, it's very powerful, uh, and many of you here are probably already using it. Okay, so with Oracle Apex, we're extending low-code to handle many more app use cases. So this is the work that we've been doing over the last few years. We've added workflows, low-code workflows into Apex. We've done a lot of work on low-code for mission-critical SaaS. And what that means is that it'll generate apps that are then configurable by the user. Uh, we've added uh, low-code for mobile, so the same app that you use on a, on, a, on a browser also can be used on a mobile device, and it's seamless. Uh, and we've also added a lot of work to to make the low-code app interoperate with all the rest of the apps with things like GraphQL and JavaScript. So we think in the, in the near future, the large majority of enterprise apps will be uh, able to be generated using low-code Apex. Now, I've talked about the data usage intent. Data usage intent comes together with Apex. So low-code apps, like coded apps, often want to use hierarchical and graph formats. So JSON and graph duality make it much easier for low-code to generate these apps. And I talked about annotations in domain. Those enable low-code to generate GUIs that are data value specific. So if you declare something with a domain or an annotation, say declare a credit card, then the GUI will automatically be generated. It says, oh, I know it's a credit card. There's certain pattern to these numbers. There's certain validation I can do. There's certain input forms I can do. Or if you say, oh, it's a password, it knows not to, to echo the characters. So you declare it in the database that Every app that uses that data knows that that's what it is and can generate the appropriate GUIs uh, with the right validation, the right certification, makes it easy to use. All right, um, here's an interesting quote. It says, healthcare systems are among the most complex systems ever built. And of course, Oracle now has uh, Cerner. And of course, healthcare record system, we're rebuilding Cerner using Apex. And this is one of the most complex apps in the world. And the fact that we can do this is a major validation of productivity and power of Apex. So if we can do life critical, super complex apps in Apex, we can do just about anything with Apex. All right, so I've talked about Apex primarily um, about, you know, in, in, in the context of OLTP applications. But we're also introducing low code into analytics. So the Oracle Autonomous Data Warehouse brings low-code to data warehousing. So it includes something called the Low-Code Data Studio that uniquely simplifies the full analytic workflow. So we have low-code data modeling with things like semantic modeling, machine learning modeling, graph modeling. We've added low-code data motion. So we have a very open uh, data sharing that can be configured using low-code, data integration, Golden Gate, data catalog, all the REST services, low-code data analysis, with things like SQL worksheet, notebooks. So we've added low-code to our data warehouse to make it dramatically simpler and easier to use and more productive for users. Okay, so that's generating apps. So we talked about generating data based on usage intent, bringing all the worlds of data together. We've talked about generating entire applications. So those are two giant transformations that are happening right now. There's a third that you might have heard about, <laughs> and it's called AI. So let's talk about that. So we've seen that declaring intent uh, provides revolutionary benefits for app professionals. Uh, now, AI search and generative AI are creating another revolution of uh, declarative intent. So using AI, all these different parties are gonna be able to search unstructured data and query using natural language. And this is something we're, we, we're adding to our database right now. Now, let's start with uh, searches on unstructured data. So there's a new way to search unstructured data, and it's called AI vectors. And I'm gonna talk about what an AI vector is and how it works. So vectors 
are used to represent the content, the semantic content, the meaning of things like documents, videos, and images. And physically, what a, what a vector is, is a sequence of numbers. Uh, those numbers are called dimensions, um, and they're meant to capture the important features of data. Okay, so that's kind of physically what it is, but I'm gonna give you an example that's gonna make it a lot clearer. So here's an example, I have a picture. I have a picture of a house. How do I represent that as a vector? Well, the numbers represent features that are specific. So for example, one number in a, in a vector might represent the type of roof. Another one might represent the decorations. Another one might represent the number of stories. Another might represent the building materials, like this is a wood house. So that's the kind of conceptual idea behind vectors. It has a bunch of numbers, usually a few hundred to a couple of thousand, and they represent the features of the thing that you're trying to represent. Now, what I showed you here is conceptually correct, but it's actually not correct. The world has moved on beyond this. Those features are now not hand-coded. It used to be that people would do, oh, this is the roof, this is the decoration, that, those days are gone. The features are now generated by machine learning algorithms. So it's not quite as simple to say what the numbers, what the numbers uh, represent because those are generated using neural nets. But the concept is still the same. Okay, so if I take house vectors and I collapse them into two dimensions instead of hundreds, it might look something like this on a two-dimensional plane. And the key thing to understand about vectors is that the distance between the vectors, when I say how different is this vector from that, that represents the semantic similarity of the underlying objects. So you see here on the, on the upper left, we have two pictures of houses that are pretty similar. They're kind of the same roof, same kind of roof, same kind of building material, same kind of windows. So their vectors would be very close together. On the other hand, in the bottom right, I have that other wooden house, which is quite different from those. So that's, those vectors would be, or that vector would be very far away from those other two vectors. So the distance between the vectors represents their semantic similarity. Not the similarity of the pixels, but what, what the house actually looks like. Okay, and the same thing applies to other kind of data. So word similarity works the same way. So when you create vectors for words, you'll see that the words that represent fruits, those vectors are close together. Words that represent animals are close together. Words that represent states are close together, but they're farther apart from, from the different kinds of objects. Now that's a simple example. What we really use is uh, vectors that represent entire documents. So what is in the document? What's the meaning of the document? What is this document about? Is it about the keynote in, in Cloud World 2023? That information is in the vector. And again, the vector that represents a document, the ones that are similar are closer together. The ones that are farther apart are, are distant. So if you have, a, if you have a, a meeting at some other thing, it's gonna be very different from the keynote. The vectors are gonna be very separate. All right, so that's the key attributes of vectors and what vectors are. So now that we know what vectors are, let's talk about how they're used. So vector search on unstructured data is normally combined with relational search on business data to solve business problems. Um, now, here's a, a few use cases you can use this technology for. So one use case is semantic document search. Search by the, by the content, the actual meaning of the document. So examples like that are, I have a user question, find me documents that are relevant to this user question. Another use case is like a product or catalog search. I describe an object and it finds it in the catalog. Another one is sentiment analysis. What is that person saying? Is it positive, is it negative? You know, how do, how do you describe what they're saying? Another use case uh, for vectors is um, semantic image search. So face recognition, is this person the same? It doesn't matter, they have glasses on, not glasses on, different clothes, you know, taken from different angles. It can identify that it's the same person because it's not comparing the pixels it's comparing the actual object. Uh, finding matching objects, finding flaws in objects. Is there a crack in this car? Is there a crack in this, in this window? That's the kind of stuff you can find using these uh, semantic image searches. You can also find similar patterns. So this is useful for things like anomaly and fraud detection. There's a sequence of events that's fraud. We look for that kind of sequence of events. Uh, product recommendations, you know, people that bought this also bought that. People that browsed this also did that. Uh, that's all represented using a vector that you can find. And trading patterns is another one. Okay, 
So let's go through an example of how this works. Um, so first of all, imagine a house hunting app that helps customers find houses for sale that are similar to a picture the customer uploads. So you're driving around town, that was the video at the very beginning, you see a house you like, take a picture of it, and you're like, hey, I want a five that's similar to this one, that looks similar to this one that's for sale. So that's the example we're gonna work through. Now, to find a match that matters to me, I have to combine that semantic search, hey, I want a house that looks like this, with business data. So in this case, the business data is things like product data. The house has to be for sale. What, what houses are for sale? Where are they for sale? What's their price? And it has to match my preference. I'm only looking for houses in Las Vegas. I'm not looking for houses in Berlin. That's way too far. I can't commute from Berlin to Las Vegas. Uh, and it has to match my, my budget. I don't care about houses that are double my budget. I don't even want to see them, even if they match the, uh, the picture. So that's how you need to combine the semantic search, the look of the house, with this business data search. Now, when you're searching on a combination of business and semantic data, it's much more effective if they're stored in the same database together. Uh, so one solution is you take all your business data and you have a separate vector database and you just feed your business data into the vector database so it's available so, so they can kind of combine them. Now, that has an obvious problem, which is you're constantly sending all your business data. You have to keep it up to date. You have to keep these two databases going. And the business data that's relevant varies widely. So you have to send a lot of, of, of business data. And when you get it to the vector database, they're really not that good at searching business data. So that has problems. Um, and so you know, we think the best solution is to add vector search to the business database. The business data is already there. You just add the vectors and then you can do queries against a combination of business data and vectors. And there's no need to move, synchronize data, manage multiple products, all that stuff. And that's something that we're announcing here at, at Cloud World this year, which is we are announcing AI vector search built into the Oracle Database 23C. And you can see this in our, in our Tech Hub. You can go to get a demo, you can see it in action. You can also sign up for the preview um, using that uh, QR code. So I'm going to describe how this works in Oracle. OK, so we're doing the house hunting app. First thing you, got to, uh, you need is a table with all the available houses, with the houses that are for sale. So that's simple. Here's a simple create table statement. You say create the table of houses for sale. What do you want in there? You want a house ID. You want the price of the house. Where is the house? What city is the house in? You want a photo of the house. And then that last thing is the key thing. You want a house vector. And that house vector is gonna contain the look of the house, basically the semantic look of the house. What does this house look like? Okay, now you have your table. I wanna find houses that are similar to this picture. So I write a three-line query. It's super simple. So I say select from my houses for sale all the pictures, all the houses, but order them by the vector distance between the house in the database and the house I'm looking for. Okay, so find me the closest matching houses, right? The ones that look the most similar to this one. That's it, that's three lines of SQL. Um, you don't have to know anything about machine learning to write that SQL. Uh, a DBA or a developer that has minimal experience with a database can learn to use this in a few minutes. I mean, I just taught you how to do it. This is it, this is the full SQL. Okay, so that's finding the closest match, but remember, we didn't want the closest matching house because that house might be thousands of miles away and I'm not interested. In it. So what you really want to do is combine that image search with the business data search. So here's how you do that. In here, we show a five-line SQL statement. You're selecting from houses for sale, but I only want to see ones whose price is in my budget. So I'm getting that budget information from the customer table. And I only want to see houses that are for sale that are in the city that I'm trying to find a house in. So again, I'm going to search, I'm going to compare the city that the house for sale is in to the city that the customer is interested in. And then I'm going to order those results, the ones that pass those queries, by the most similar houses. So now what this returns is houses in my budget, in my city, that look the most like this. So I've combined business data and AI vector data in one query, five lines of SQL, a single integrated solution that's fully consistent. And that's the big win in putting it all together. 
And it's really important, this is really important, which is you don't have to be an AI expert. Anybody who knows anything about databases can write this query. It's super simple, uh, which is very different from in the past. I mean, we at Oracle have had a lot of machine learning algorithms in the Oracle database, but you had to know a lot about AI. You had to know how to create a model. You had to know all the different kinds of models you can create it from. You had to have training data. You had to train the model. You had to set the hyperparameters. There's a whole bunch of work that you had to do, and you, and you had to know a lot of, of knowledge about to create that. Um, now, with this AI vector search, you don't have to know any of that stuff. You just write simple SQL, and you're done. Any developer can do this. Any DBA can do this. It's, it's ultra simple. It's actually much more powerful than what we had in the past, but also a thousand times simpler. Anybody could do this. OK, so that's a key concept. So what, what did we do in Oracle database uh, with vectors? I showed you the vector data type. So what do we have? We have, all you need to know is there's a new type of data. It's just like date, character, number. There's another data type. It's called vector. You put your vectors in there. It's just the column type. I showed you there's a comparison function. There's only one operation on vectors. Compare these two vectors. Compare the distance of the two vectors. That's it. That's the only operation. There's no point in looking at the numbers or doing anything else. It's about a thousand times simpler than implementing JSON or something like that. Super simple. Store the vector, compare the vectors. Those are the only two operations. And then the, the third thing that's specific to vectors is we're adding very fast vector indexes. So when you compare these things, you don't want to compare it to get every house in the world. You want a vector index that is a new type of index that does very fast comparisons across the vectors. But again, you don't have to know how this works. You just say create vector index on this column. You got the vector index. Super simple. OK. And then because we built a, a relational database over the last you know, 45 years, we have a lot of technology that we can bring into the vector space. So for example, you can partition your vector index. So in, in the example I'm using, you can partition your vector index by the city. So essentially, that creates a separate vector index for each city. So you're not looking at vectors at all that aren't even in the city that I'm interested. There's no point in looking at vectors for houses in Berlin when I'm looking for Las Vegas. So that happens automatically. It's a standard database technology. Partition your, your index by a relational column. Uh, it, the whole thing works transparently on real application clusters. So we have our scale out solution. It's like every other data type. It automatically um, works across all the nodes of a cluster. The data is fully consistent. Um, something that's interesting is these vector searches, like that, that house search that I was showing you, this is an OLTP operation. It happens in real time. So when you, when you say, find me houses, immediately you get a response. And a vector query will typically respond in a few milliseconds. So it's, it's real time. This is an OLTP operation. It's not, a, it's not a report. It's not an analytic operation. And one thing you can do with Rack for many years is you can isolate nodes. So if you have your OLTP system and you're worried about, hey, I don't want to add all this weird vector stuff because it might mess up my OLTP, you can just run it on a separate set of nodes, but it can access all the data in the database, something we've been able to do in Rack for years. Uh, we can transparently offload vector searches to Exadata Storage. So we've had this smart storage. If you're searching through a lot of data, you send the search to the data. You don't bring the data to the search. This is something we've been doing for years. We're doing it with vectors. You can shard your vectors. So if, if you have regulations that say, hey, the, the data for Europe needs to stay in Europe, the data for India needs to stay in India, you can do that. You can use sharding to spread out your vectors to where you need them. You can use it for... Um, for uh, distributed databases, for higher scalability, for anything like that. And there's all these other features that come to bear with, with vectors also. So everything that we've built, we've built parallel SQL, transactions, analytics, disaster recovery, security, all that stuff applies, um, which it doesn't really apply when you have a new vector database. They haven't built any of this stuff. All right. So that's, that's, um, that's kind of what it is, what we've built, how, you know, what are the benefits of it? Now, adding semantic search to relational, which is what I've been talking about, that's great. But we can take it a step further. What happens if we add generative AI on top of that? Then things get even more interesting. So vector search plus generative AI enables end users to declare their intent by simply using natural language questions. 
So you're gonna ask the database things in natural language. And the way this works is that uh, AI vector search maps the natural language question to the relevant data in the database. So depending on the question, it finds the relevant data in the database. And then the user question plus the relevant data is handed over to the generative AI to answer your question. So that's kind of the big picture of how it works. But let's, I'm gonna go through the details now of exactly how this works, because this is a big deal. This is kind of a, a big transformation in how data and databases are gonna get used. So, you know, my analogy, um, and we've all used things like ChatGPT and we've tried it out. My analogy is kind of like a smart college grad. Um, it has a lot of general knowledge about the world, but it doesn't necessarily know anything or a whole lot about your specific products, your specific business. But it's very smart about the general world. Um, so the analogy is, imagine you hire a smart college grad to answer support calls, so to, to answer your company's support calls. Well, it, it knows a lot about stuff, but it doesn't know anything about your products. It doesn't know what kind of failures other customers have seen, what kind of solutions we provided them. So it's not gonna be very good at answering questions. So when a user asks a question, it's gonna say, you know, what happened to my phone? It started beeping and the battery started going and I got this error. If you ask generative AI, it's gonna be like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know anything about that specific product, right? But now if you could augment that generative AI's knowledge with all the support information that you've accumulated, all the previous uh, kind of errors that customers have, have reported, then it could provide much better answers. And that's basically what uh, retrieval augmented generation does. And that's where the vector databases come in. So the vector database can augment the generative AI by retrieving detailed content that's often private to you uh, that you need to answer questions. And this is called retrieval augmented generation. So you retrieve business specific content and you augment the AI using that content. And the word, it's, you know, R-A-G, RAG, you're gonna hear a lot. If you haven't heard a lot, Already, you're gonna hear a lot going forward. Retrieval augmented generation, that's how, that's how the world of data basically meets the world of AI, through retrieval augmented generation. So remember that one. All right, so how does this work? Um, so the user, end user asks a question. Hey, whatever it is I just said, I, you know, my phone is overheating, it's beeping, and I get this error, right? So the first thing that happens is that question gets uh, encoded into a vector, okay? So it's turned into a vector. Now, once it's a vector, I use that vector to search my vector database, to search the vectors in my Oracle database to match documents that closely match it. So I'm looking at my support documents, past customer issues, past problems that I know about. I'm searching through all that stuff to find the most relevant content for that specific question. Once I find it, I pull it out from the database, and I put it together with the question and hand it to the generative AI. So now generative AI, it's got general knowledge, it has the specific knowledge of past incidents that are related to this, and it can provide an, a natural language answer to the question. So that's, that's how this whole process works and how it all fits together, okay? So that's retrieval augmented generation, and that's how databases work with AI. Now, I'm delighted now to be joined by one of the world's top experts in generative AI. Um, this expert co-authored the, the paper, Attention is All You Need, which introduced the transformers. And those of you that follow generative AI know that transformers is the groundbreaking neural net architecture that is the foundation of all the generative AI that's out there. So please welcome Aidan Gomez, the CEO of Cohere, to the stage. <laughs> Hi, Aiden. Hey, Thanks for joining us. Great to be here. So, Aiden, sometimes I talk about this AI generative AI. It's kind of like magic. You ask questions and it answers, and he's the magician. He's the guy that does this. <laughs> the guy that invented the magic behind generative AI, or one of the people that, that invented the magic behind. So, it's a great pleasure to have you here, Aiden. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your company, Cohere, and, and a little bit about your background also? Yeah, of course. So uh, my co-founders and I, Nick and Ivan, myself, 
We started the company about four years ago. And before that, I had been at Google Brain, which is Google's AI research lab. And I was part of the team that created the Transformer, which is uh, the backbone of this latest revolution in AI. And what Cohere does is we build two different types of models. So the first type you might be familiar with, uh, thanks to the chatbots that are on the inter internet and available to consumers, it's called generative models. The second type, which was just introduced, are embedding models. And what these do are they, they transform text into vectors, which can then be fed into a vector database. Uh, and yeah, that's us. Yeah, so you're the guy, so he's the guy that takes the image, takes the document, and does the magic to convert it into a vector, which is a bunch of numbers, but not just any numbers, numbers that represent the semantic content of the object. So, okay, so that's great. So that's, that's how you interact with vector databases. So what high value AI use cases is Cohere used for? So one of the um, most popular use cases is knowledge augmentation. Um, so for instance, when you have knowledge workers, Oftentimes, they have to conduct this really laborious research process, which can take weeks or months. They get a question that needs an answer. They need to read 100 documents to get an answer to that question. With knowledge assistance, what we can do is have the model do that for them. And so they can ask that question to the model. The model has access to the entirety of the internet. And now, thanks to vector databases and RAG, they can also have proprietary information do that research for you, synthesize it, distill, summarize, and then come back with a verifiable answer. Wow, that's amazing stuff. But um, are there any challenges that organizations are seeing with generative AI? Definitely, so you know, generative AI is amazing and the progress is staggering, uh, but there definitely are challenges. For instance, the major one that I'm sure a lot of you know about is hallucination, so these models can make up stuff. They can just dream up facts which aren't actually accurate. And that's a, that's a huge issue in terms of, you know, being able to trust and rely on the underlying technology. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that comes up a lot. And, you know, we talked a little bit about RAG. Tell us how RAG helps with that. Yeah, so RAG is the most promising solution to the issue of hallucinations. Uh, it gives you two different things. The first is reliability. So now, instead of just needing to take the language model's output on its word, what you can do is, because the model is going out, querying, pulling back documents and using that as part of an answer, it can cite. It can cite exactly where it drew that information from, and so the humans can verify. They can trust this model. Um, the second major benefit is the fact that these models, when they're initially trained, they're trained on the open web. So they only know what's publicly available out on the internet. That's not really relevant for a lot of enterprises. You want to be able to leverage your internal IP, your own data, and do that in a way that's completely secure. And so by, by being able to use RAG to sit these models down next to your internal databases, your data stores, what that model is now able to do is know everything that your organization knows. And that creates a much more useful user experience. Yeah, definitely. It's, I, I compare it to kind of cramming before a test. You get, all, you get the relevant information, and suddenly it's, it's fresh in your brain. Um, actually, I have another question for you, which is, what's the difference between training on all your documents versus using RAG? Like, why would you do one or the other? Yeah, so training is very good at changing the personality of the model, making the model speak in your brand voice, but it's not so great at adding knowledge. If you wanna add knowledge and you wanna keep it up to date on a daily, hourly, millisecond basis, you can't do that with training. You can't retrain every millisecond. But what you can do is you can update your databases every millisecond. And so this keeps your models fresh, always up to date, and you can constantly change their knowledge base. You can pull out things if you don't want it to know that, you can add new things in, and so the model is always up to date. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. I and mean, you know, in that house hunting model we talked about, if a new house comes on the market, boom, it's instantly available. If a house gets sold, you can take it off instantly. You don't have to retrain a model and wait you know, a week, a month or something for that to happen and spend millions of dollars on the exactly, training. Exactly. So yeah, that's, that's a big deal, which is why 
retrieval augmented generation is going to be a big deal for the for the database world. So a, a super amount of cool stuff. It's very transformative. What are you looking at for the future? What's your next thing that you're going to do? Yeah, so there's a lot that's coming down the pipe, but the thing I'm most excited about today is the introduction of our new embeddings models. And so hopefully, as you can see on the screen, we've just introduced our latest embeddings, which frankly blow the competition out of the water, specifically on data sets that are more heterogeneous, that include multiple different sources of data. They might be a little bit noisy. In that case, we perform about twice as well as a competition. And it's not just accuracy, it's also speed, scalability, and efficiency. So during the training of this model, we specifically focused on being able to compress them. And we can do that 32-fold. And so compressing these models 32 times over preserves 96% uh, of the accuracy. Yeah. Super excited to have that in there. Yeah, that lowers the costs, gives totally. you faster results. Yeah. yeah and yeah. as we mentioned, you know, this is a world where people want results immediately. So you do the search, you want the result right now. You're not, you don't want it five minutes from now. You're driving around the town. You need the result right now. So that's very cool. And this, uh, the, uh, the uh, noisy data, maybe describe a little bit of what, what does it mean, noisy data? Yeah, so oftentimes your data sets aren't necessarily clean. They contain uh, perhaps different sources of knowledge coming in from you know, PDF scrapes, which have their own particular formatting errors from the scraping process, and also maybe some emails in there which look entirely different. With uh, search, uh, with embedding mechanisms of the past, those would be treated as quite separate. And so the results that you would get for a query would be missing parts of the information because they'd focus over here. What we've done as part of our training is bring that together, unify it, and so no matter how noisy or different the structure and formatting of these databases are, you're able to get extremely, extremely accurate results. No, so it's real world problems, solving real world problems, which we love, we love solving real world problems. So, hey, thanks for joining me. We're really excited about our, our partnership with Cohere. Likewise. And we wish you great success. Thank you so much. <laughs>
the generative AI on this language, this blueprint language for generating, um, generating apps, so it can generate the blueprint for the new app. So very cool stuff. Um, and then finally, uh, data professionals are also gonna use generative AI. I mean, they're also using AI today. We, we've introduced a lot of AI technology. Um, and the main thing we're using AI uh, today for is to free developers, uh, to, I'm sorry, to free data professionals to pursue intent. So for example, we have our autonomous database that uses AI to eliminate things like routine management, like patching, security scaling. We've done a lot of work on using AI to find and fix workload issues, find and identify uh, um, any kind of slowdowns, any kind of uh, um, uh, looking forward things that we think might break or might exhaust. So we're using the AI technology internally to free database professionals like to go do uh, work with application developers to develop applications faster, because that's what, where the real productivity is coming from. Okay, so we've talked a lot about these benefits of AI. Um, are there limits to this? How, how far can it really go? How far can you get with generative AI? Uh, can generative AI actually replace experts? Do you need experts anymore? Um, well, you really do still need experts because generative AI can't really generate a complete solution. What it really does is generate a first draft. And then an expert has to come in and understand that first draft, whether it's the SQL statement, the app, um, and then they have to validate that it's correct, they have to correct it if it's not, and they have to evolve it as the, as the future goes on. Uh, and to get a little more specific, um, will generative AI be able to generate the application code that businesses use to solve their data needs? So can you just, you hear a lot about code generation. Can you generate the code for an app? Well, there's really two answers to this. First of all, it can't. And second of all, so to generate a full app might require hundreds of thousands of lines of code, right? Uh, so first of all, I really can't do that. Um, and the second thing is, even if it could, let's say it could generate 200,000 lines of Java to, to implement your app. Uh, if it generated 200,000 lines of Java, that's gonna be handed to an expert, and they have to understand it, verify it, maintain it, and extend it. And that's really not a fun process. That's a lot of code. Uh, and they didn't develop it. Uh, so it's not a good idea to generate hundreds of thousands of lines of code. So we'll, what we see the future as is the AI is gonna generate declarative intent. It's that same thing. Tell me what you want, not how to do it. So it will generate, take your, you, your description and generate a blueprint, like an Apex blueprint that says, here is what you want in the specific language of, of uh, implementing an app. Um, and of course, you know, generated apps will be simpler, more reliable and extensible if they generate app blueprints instead of trying to generate you know, 200,000 lines of code that then some developer has to deal with, okay? So let's back up and, and, and talk about you know, all the things that, that we discussed today. What is the future of data in app dev? So first of all, we started by saying that the relational model uh, provides the most solid foundation for building apps. Why? Because it has very clean logical model, you got normalized tables, you ensure data consistency, it also has uh, a SQL language, which allows you to declare declarative intent, which is much more productive than writing code. You know, those, those little lines of SQL I showed you would take hundreds, thousands of lines of code to implement. Um, also, relational database separates the logical model from the storage model. So this enables all sorts of transparent application optimization. So because of that, uh, underneath the covers, we can implement indexes, parallel SQL, denormalization, partitioning, exadata, all these things, and the application is completely not affected. So this is the beauty of the relational model. Now, what's happened is some apps and developers say, hey, this relational thing is kind of inconvenient, I don't really like it. What I really want to work in is in terms of JSON or in terms of graph. And that's created a mismatch between what developers want and what the, the relational databases provide, which complicates the app dev. So to satisfy these, these preferences, what, what the developers want, what's happened is the world of data has split into pieces. So we've created a world in which there's JSON apps and JSON databases with JSON storage. In another world in which there's graph apps 
and graph uh, databases and graph storage. And then we have the traditional relational database. So the world of data is kind of split into these, these worlds that don't talk to each other and are completely separated. And what we're doing with duality views is we're bringing all this back together. We're bringing back uh, app dev together. We're bringing back data together. So the idea is that the JSON duality and graph views generate the app's preferred format. And of course, we've all we've built this. This isn't just some layer on top of the database. It's, it's built into the core of the database. We've built special transaction processing models, special optimization models. Um. <laughs> all right. Um, and what this allows is much more flexibility. It's much more powerful for developers because they can choose the preferred format by use case and will generate. So if you have a single app, that app can choose to write part of what its data access using JSON, part of it using relational, part of it using graph. You don't have to pick one storage format and that determines everything. So you get the ultimate in flexibility, you get use-centric data. And use-centric data enables simpler application development. Okay, and on top of that, we're generating apps using low-code to accelerate productivity. So the Apex low-code builds on top of these duality views, and it delivers simplicity without limits for enterprise apps. So that's the, the low-code on top of that. And then on top of that, we add AI to further accelerate productivity. So there's a number of things we've done for AI. I've talked about we've added AI vectors as a native data type, first-class data type, into the Oracle database. You can combine the vector search, the semantic context search, with business data search to get true business results. And then you can layer the generative AI on top to allow things like natural language questions, generating JSON duality, generating SQL, generating Apex blueprints. So all these things that I've talked about work together. Those three transformational changes can all be layered on top of each other to create a, a massive improvement in productivity. All right, so these are the key takeaways for today. Number one, we're entering a new age where we're getting more and more declarative intent up the stack, and it's accelerated by AI. Number two, all these different kinds of users will generate solutions instead of hand coding them. Hand coding will become rarer and rarer. And number three, all this together is gonna to enable radical improvements in app dev productivity. These are huge changes that are happening in the world of data, and they're all coming together and over the next few years, we're going to see the world completely change uh, in terms of, of uh, data and app devs. All right, so thanks for coming today. Um, I encourage you to embrace these changes to reap the rewards. Uh, and there's, there's a lot happening here at, uh, at Cloud World. You, you can go to our Database World Lounge on the third floor, and you can talk to our experts in person. You can go over to the Tech Hub and you'll see a lot of this technology that I've talked about being demoed. How you use generative AI, vector databases, duality views. You can see all that in action, ask questions, get familiar with it, or you can use this uh, QR code to get a lot more information. All right, hope you enjoyed this today and thanks for coming.